it gives me great pleasure to introduce myself today. I'm just kidding, I won't do that. So I'm, I'm gonna talk to you today about uh, therapeutic radiation, uh, clinical overview, and then um, Dr. Ralph Wexelbaum will be speaking at four o'clock and he'll give more of a, a research-focused talk. Um, just a few disclosures. Oops, sorry, jumped ahead. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up out on the West Coast, did undergrad at uh, UC Berkeley, go Bears. I was uh, taught skiing for a couple of years and then blew out my knee and decided to go to med school. I've uh, been in Chicago pretty much since 2003. Um, I did my medical school at UIC and then residency and a medical education fellowship at University of Chicago. And I also, a couple of years ago, completed a master's of health professions education at University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, my current role, I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Radiation and Cellular Oncology. I'm also a medical, the medical student clerkship director and associate residency program director. So I have four clinical days a week, um, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Wednesday is an academic day, although I also do a lot of things in the evenings or weekends or other random times. Uh, and I live in Hyde Park. Um, these are my three goofballs. Uh, I have quarantined myself in the bedroom, so I'm sitting in a lazy boy chair right now so that they won't disturb us. So uh, enough about me. Let me kind of move on. So I, I do want to take a quick second. This is actually a little Pritzker history for you, but to talk about my clinical care philosophy. Um, so I heard this uh, from a former dean of the medical school. His name was Sam Hellman. He said, be a good person, then a good doctor, then a good oncologist then a good radiation oncologist in that order. Uh, and he was the dean of the medical school from 1988 to 1993. So he was kind of like uh, Dean Polonsky is now. Um, and I would say I kind of take that back around to say to be a good doctor, you should do unto others. And it's called the golden rule, but it's, it's not named after me. Um, so that's just a little side note. So, all right, everybody get out your phone. Let's see, hopefully this, yeah, this should work. So um, you can either go to the website at the top um, or you can text Dan Golden 293 to that number, and then uh, you can choose. So uh, I have a couple questions, a little experiment. Uh, have you ever taken a prescription medication? Yes or no? Let's see, there we go. So we're starting to get some responses. Wow, somebody has never taken a prescription medication in their life. That's impressive. This could be antibiotics for you know an ear infection or uh, all right, that's more what I expected. All right, well, we'll keep going. So um, I just you know, would like to point out almost everybody says they've taken a prescription medicine. Uh, next slide, how do I, let's see. There we go, all right, let's try another one. So now you should just be able to respond with the answer. Have you, have you ever undergone a surgical procedure of any kind? So still a majority of folks, all right. Definitely a, a vast majority. Some could be a minor surgery, but some, you know, it seems like most folks have had surgery. All right, last one. Have you ever received radiotherapy? It looks like almost everybody, and I, I have a sneaking suspicion, the person that said yes may have accidentally been responding to the prior question. Um, nobody has to answer. It's anonymous, but you know, the point here, I think, is that when you talk to patients, they understand the concept of taking a drug, they understand the concept of surgery, they may be scared about the side effects of chemotherapy or scared about undergoing a major operation for cancer, but uh, very few people have experienced radiotherapy in their life before they come and see me in clinic. Um, so just to give you an outline, and I, I'm going to have to speed this up a little bit, so I may skip or just talk quickly, but I want to give you a brief overview of oncology, kind of how I view it, um, clinical oncology, talk about what is radiation, review a brief history of radiation oncology as a specialty. Uh, we'll spend most of the time talking about the radiation oncology patient care path, a little bit about biology and physics, and then I have a couple of case examples. Um, so the 30,000 foot view of oncology in, um, in my view is, um, at least for um, therapeutic oncology, you know, we've talked before about how oncology overall spans from preventative medicine all the way through to survivorship and hospice and palliative care. But when we're actively treating a malignancy, you have medical oncology, which is going to be drug or systemic therapy. 
Dr. Hahn, Dr. Swice, Dr. Olapade, Dr. Hoffman are medical oncologists. You have surgical oncologists, which there are formally trained surgical oncologists. So Mitch Posner, um, Kevin Rogan, if you've heard their names, are surgical oncologists at the university. Uh, Jen Sang, um, they do oftentimes like hepatobiliary surgery or breast surgery. But really, in my mind, any surgeon that operates on malignancy is a surgical oncologist. So that would include dermatologists, urologists, ENTs, neurosurgeons. Um, so you can see there's a whole spectrum of surgical oncologists when you start to look at it in that frame, uh, with that uh, viewpoint. And then lastly is radiation oncologists, which would be me. Um, we do four years of dedicated residency and training in radiation oncology. We're board certified to treat all sites and tumors. And we interact daily on a daily basis with physicians from all specialties. That's actually one of the things I really enjoy about it. So how do I explain why we do radiation to patients? Um, you know, in the simplest terms, if you take this schematic of a brain tumor, um, you have the tumor itself, which is the blue area with microscopic extensions, which would be the little, um, you know, the pieces of the star coming off, and then you have microscopic cancer, maybe that is spread elsewhere in the brain or in the body if it's not a brain tumor. Um, so if you do surgery, you can go in and cut out what you can see, but obviously you can't just keep cutting out parts of the brain or you take out people's memory or they'd have loss of severe loss of function or other problems. Um, you can do chemotherapy, which bathes the entire brain in a, a drug. That's good at getting rid of microscopic cells, you know, maybe shrinking down microscopic disease that's left around where the surgery was. Um, but that's where radiation comes in. We can kind of bridge the gap. So I can target radiation at a specific part of the body. Um, we can balance the therapeutic ratio. We can give a high dose of radiation, but it's split it up into multiple treatments that's going to allow normal tissue to heal, <clears throat> um, but uh, kill the cancer cells. And so I tell patients that it's better than surgery at treating normal tissue. You can treat more normal tissue around uh, where the primary tumor was, and it's better than chemotherapy, getting rid of clumps of lar you know, larger clumps of microscopic cells because it doesn't rely on blood supply to get to where it's going. And when we combine all three of these treatments together, we call it trimodality or combined modality therapy. And there are many tumors, many malignancies that we treat with trimodality therapy. There's also many malignancies that we can treat with one or two of these. Um, uh, you know, skin cancer can be treated surgically or with curative radiation. Prostate cancer can be treated with radiation or surgery. Um, we can treat throat cancer with radiation and chemotherapy by itself. Uh, so, but that's kind of the general paradigm for these three um, treatments. All right, what is radiation? So, actually, let me just stop. I'm going to try to check for questions. Any questions about that so far? I know it's pretty basic. You could type them in or unmute yourself. All right, we'll keep going. Um, so what is radiation? So, uh, you know, the general definition is it's the action or process of radiating or the process of emitting radiant energy in the form of waves or particles. So you may remember from uh, freshman physics, E equals H nu. So energy is proportional to the frequency of a photon. Um, and it's uh, inversely proportional H over lambda to the, uh, the wavelength. So higher frequency, shorter wavelength is going to be higher energy photon. Um, in, uh, you know, light is radiation. So I tell patients when we're sitting in a console, they say, you know, the light you're seeing is radiation. I just use much higher energy radiation. Uh, diagnostic radiologists, the way I describe the difference between what I do and what they do is they use low energy x-rays to look at things. And in my clinic, I use high energy x-rays to kill things, preferably the cancer. Um, so a question for everyone, what is the difference between a gamma ray or x-ray, and you can respond here. Uh, gamma rays compared to x-rays, do they have a lower energy, a higher energy, the same energy, or it's complicated? One problem I've noticed with this uh, system, ah, there we go, is if everybody answers the same response, you can't tell how many people have answered. But, all right, so almost everybody is saying higher energy, one person said it's complicated. So the correct answer here is kind of it's complicated, although uh, there is a definition. So um, does anyone know the difference between a gamma ray and an X-ray? You can unmute yourself. Don't be shy, there's no. Do I have to call on somebody? Let's see. 
Santiago, I know you. Santiago, can you take a stab at this? Do you know what the difference is between a gamma ray and an X-ray? Um, so from freshman physics in college, um, I just remember the gamma rays and X-rays are on different uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, varying in the amount of energy or the, the wavelength. So, so that's a common common answer, and it's uh, actually a common misconception because when I go through the history of radiation, you'll see. But gamma rays, a hundred years ago, were the highest energy photons that we could get, whereas X-rays were low energy, and that's because the definition is a gamma ray comes from natural decay of a radioactive isotope, whereas an X-ray comes from a man-made source. Um, and so 100 years ago, X-rays came from low energy cathode ray tubes, whereas gamma rays we could get from radium and other natural compounds, so they were higher energy than X-rays. But in the modern era, we can produce X-rays that are much higher energy than gamma rays that come from things like radium or cobalt, which used to be considered high energy photons. So really the only difference is where they come from. And uh, um, once you have a photon emitted, whether it's from natural decay, like from radium or iridium or cesium, or it's from an X-ray generator, like a linear accelerator, you can have two photons, one's a gamma ray, one's an X-ray with the same energy and they're identical as far as their effect on tissue. Uh, so kind of a trick question, but um, most of the time people answer what uh, Santiago did because Many of the spectra you see in textbooks show gamma rays as higher energy for historical reasons. All right, so let me go over a brief history of radiation oncology. It's kind of a cool field because we know the day that it started, or maybe the month. Um, you know, unlike uh, most other specialties where there's Egyptian papyrus scroll, scrolls of surgery for breast cancer, you know, people have been taking drugs for centuries. Um, radiation didn't exist until, eight, well, it existed. We weren't aware of it really until 1895. So Rankin discovered x-rays in um, late 1895 and published a paper on it. He won a Nobel Prize in 1901. And um, a year later, Becquerel interestingly discovered natural radioactive decay. So it's kind of an interesting historical note that we found man-made x-rays before we discovered natural radioactive decay. And these, these top two images here, the one on the left is um, uh, Rankin's wife's hand. Any ideas what that dark spot is on her finger? Someone can, wedding ring. Yeah, wedding ring. I see somebody, a couple people type. Yeah, so that's that's her wedding ring. Um, so this is thought to be the first radiograph ever taken. And then on the right, this is from Becquerel's lab notebook. What he did was he put two pieces of uranium on uh, radiochromic paper. So it's like photographic paper, but it exposes at much higher um, energies. And under one of them, he put the Mal a Maltese cross, which is a, a cross that has the arms that flare out. Uh, and he, you know, made the, you know, inferred that if there, that by putting the uranium on the paper, you can expose it, it must be emitting um, uh, photons. And, and so he, that was the discovery of natural radioactive decay. Uh, Marie and Pierre Curie, you know, are quite famous. They characterize many radioactive compounds, and all three of them won the Nobel Prize. Um, now, in the 1890s, there weren't IRBs and patient safety monitoring boards, uh, and so it's kind of crazy to think that within several months of Rankin publishing his findings of x-rays, people were around the world trying to treat cancer and other conditions with x-rays. And it's thought that the first patients treated with cancer were actually in Chicago by Emil Grubb, although there's an interesting expose on this from TBS a few years ago where they went back and tried to find records of the patients he claimed to have treated and they had trouble finding them. So uh, there's speculation, maybe that's not true, but most textbooks will tell you the first patients treated for cancer with x-rays were in Chicago. Um, in the early 1900s, the field was really dominated by low energy x-rays produced by cathode ray tubes. And then the quote, high energy photons were coming from things like radium. Um, and that was really the first 50 years. And there's a lot of history that I'll, I'll talk about in a second. It wasn't until the 1950s that two things happened. One was um, we began to develop something called a linear accelerator, which was a really high energy x-ray production device. Uh, and the other thing was cobalt-60 began to get used clinically. Um, so cobalt-60 is a, um, a 
an isotope that decays and releases high energy photons. So does anybody have an idea why it wasn't until the 1950s that we started using cobalt 60? It actually, in a way, loops back to University of Chicago. So what, what went on in the early 1940s at the University of Chicago? There's a, a big sculpture. Ah, Vivek said, needed the radioactive stuff for nukes. Yeah, so um, the uh, uh, development of the atomic bomb, atomic energy, you started to get these new radioactive isotopes that were from um, byproducts of nuclear fission. And so cobalt-60 is one of those. And so cobalt-60 was a byproduct that is relatively stable. It has a high, um, it emits uh, um, uh, high energy photons, it's very predictable. So they're able to install that into clinics. It's actually from the fixed 50s into the 80s or 90s, cobalt-60 was one of the primary ways patients were treated with radiation. In the 19, late 1960s, we started to do something called radio surgery, which is very focused, targeted radiation at tumors in the brain. Um, the crazy thing is if you look at that in the context of other medical technology development, the CT scan wasn't even invented until 1970 and PET scans weren't around until 75, let alone MRIs. So they were targeting tumors in the brain just using uh, clinical findings and then uh, orthogonal x-ray imaging. Um, side effects have come down significantly since they used to do that. In the 1980s, proton therapy was developed. We also started to develop with uh, computers con using controlled uh, devices inside the treatment head so we could create um, unusual shapes to shape the radiation. And this evolved into something called intensity modulated radiation. And then in the 2000s, which is around when I got into the field, image guided radiation. So using diagnostic imaging modalities like x-rays, CT scans, um, ultrasound, even MRI and PET scan are now being used to guide where we target our therapeutic radiation. And in the last 10 years, what's really taken off something called stereotactic body radiotherapy, where we target basically anywhere we want in the body with very high energy, um, highly focused conformal radiation and obliterate the tumor rather than traditional radiation where we give many small little treatments and kind of slowly kill it. So we'll see where things go in 2020. Um, interesting, well, not interesting, uh, sad historical side note, and you know, obviously now with IRBs and data safety monitoring boards, sometimes research can be more cumbersome, but that's for good reason. Uh, you know, in the early 1900s, nobody knew about the late effects of radiation. So there was this uh, rush to treat basically everything and anything. So um, we were treating malignancies, but also treating benign conditions, tinea capitis, tonsillitis, enlarged thymus, ankylosing spondylitis, um, acne even. I, I had a patient in my clinic who was treated for acne when she was much younger, and her face was, the musculature on her face was slightly atrophy, and I have a sneaking suspicion it was related to her acne treatment. Um, tennis elbow, radiation is a very good anti-inflammatory. So um, uh, they would just give a little dose of radiation to the extensor bundle on the, on the elbow and the pain would go away. Uh, we started to see late effects from some of these. So they used to treat infants with an enlarged thymus radiation to the upper chest. And 30, 40, 50 years later, what kind of malignancy do you think we saw higher rates of? What, uh, what endocrine glands? It's uh, there, somebody, thyroid cancer. Yeah, very good. Um, so this actually, there was a huge series of these cases at Michael Reese Hospital, which used to be just south of McCormick Place. It was one of the premier hospitals in Chicago for decades. And in the 50s and 60s, they treated a, a large number of children or infants for enlarged thymus. 30 years later, they started coming in with uh, thyroid cancers. Uh, ankylosing spondylitis. So now we have very good anti-rheumatic drugs, but um, it could be a debilitating illness 100 years ago. And so uh, when they found radiation was a good anti-inflammatory, they would give a low dose of radiation every couple of months to the lumbosacral spine. Inflammation would go away and then start to flare up again. They'd give another low dose of radiation. Um, any ideas what long-term or what late malignancy developed from that? This one's less commonly known, but uh, they're radiating a large volume of bone marrow, right? Lumbo, lumbar spine, sacrum, pelvis. Uh, so they would get uh, leukemias. Yeah, so somebody said AML, exactly. So, uh, and then this image on the right, has anybody seen this before? Does anybody wanna take a guess what this is? You can type it in or say it. It's 
Let's see, somebody said microscope. Uh, it's a scope of some, some kind, although it's not micro. So this was another example of using x-rays. So they would use it to measure people's feet. Um, yeah, somebody guessed macroscope, very good. <laughs> um, so the, you can see the woman on the right is having her feet measured and then the shoe salesman on the left is looking. And they used to do this in ch with children too. And I actually saw somebody posted, there used to be an old shoe store on 53rd Street in Hyde Park and they had one of these and people remember going in there. This was on like a Hyde Park Facebook group. People remember going in there and having their feet measured with a fluoroscope. We now don't use radiation for almost anything benign. You know, we're very careful about diagnostic radiation. We try to minimize exposure to patients, especially children, uh, because we now know radiation can cause chromosomal and DNA damage, which can increase, lead to an increased risk of malignancy. Um, in the, uh, um, you know, in the oncology setting, we balance the very small risk of causing a malignancy, at least in adults, against the very real benefit of treating a known cancer. So I describe it to patients as when you have surgery, there's a very small risk you don't wake up. When you have chemotherapy, there's a very small risk of a severe reaction. Um, and with radiation, there's a very small risk of developing a cancer 15, 20 years down the road. Um, and, and they understand that. Now in children, it's a different story and um, we do everything we can to minimize risk of late toxicity. Tara Henderson, I believe is talking next week, um, and her expertise is late effects of childhood cancer treatment. So, um, all right, so with that, any questions? Um, otherwise, I'm gonna move on to talk about the patient care path. I wanna finish at four o'clock. Let's see, how common is photodynamic therapy used and for which type of cancers? Um, so uh, photodynamic therapy actually is not radio radiotherapy. Photodynamic therapy is using um, a drug that it, when exposed to a certain frequency of light, at least this is my understanding of it because I don't do it, it triggers a, um, a reaction you know, and kills the tissue. So um, the pulmonologists I know are using this in, um, like in the lung with bronchoscopy, and then I know they've used it for, to treat skin conditions, um, but that is not something that we use in the radiotherapy clinic. So uh, you know, photodynamic therapy essentially would be using something in the visible light spectrum that triggers, I think, a, an activation of a drug um, versus what I do, which is using very high energy photons to direct them at an area and, and kill tissue. So um, hopefully that answers that. Um, one other thing to point out is there's a difference. I'm, I'm not an interventional radiologist. So interventional radiologists, like I said, they're, they're an extension of diagnostic radiology. So they use diagnostic imaging modalities, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, et cetera, ultrasound to guide a therapy or intervention of some kind. Could be placing a catheter, a stent, they might obliterate something with radiofrequency ablation or cryotherapy, um, but they don't use high energy x-rays to treat things. Um, there's a couple exceptions to that, although even there, they, they infuse something called therospheres, which are radioactive gold seeds, uh, not gold, glass beads into the liver, for example, and it preferentially gets taken into the tumor because tumors are supplied primarily by the hepatic artery, whereas the rest of the liver, a lot of the blood comes from the portal system. Um, but even there, they're really using the intervent, the diagnostic radiology techniques to guide where they put the glass beads. And radiation oncologists often are involved. We aren't at the university, but I have colleagues around the country that go into those procedures with the interventional radiologist and it's the radiation oncologist that calculates the actual dose of the glass beads, the radioactive glass beads. Um, it gets confusing, but uh, in simplest terms, I use high energy x-rays or photons to kill things. Again, preferably the cancer, not, not other things. Um, all right, so the patient care paths. So when I see a patient, they come in for a consult, they then undergo a simulation to map out where we want to target the tumor. There's a treatment planning process, quality assurance check, they get treatment, and then they go into follow-up. So at the initial consult, we review the patient's records, um, develop a preliminary plan, do a full history and physical. And then really, there's at some point a binary decision, and this is where I think radiation oncology uh, 
in some ways is more like a surgical specialty uh, where there's a binary decision whether or not you're going to treat, just like you would decide whether or not to take somebody to the operating room. Um, you then have to decide though on the amount of radiation, where you're gonna target, uh, and you obtain informed consent. So there's uh, several different radiation ways of delivering radiotherapy in the clinic. Uh, the most common way, kind of the workhorse of modern radiation oncology is called the linear accelerator. Um, and so uh, linear accelerators can produce multiple energies, multiple energies of x-rays as well as electrons. There's this alphabet soup of different kinds of treatments we can do with linear accelerators. I'm not gonna get into that today. There's also specific types. There's something called a cyber knife or tomotherapy but these are really just specialized linear accelerators. Um, so this is a cyber knife. What it is, and I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but uh, the head of this unit is a linear accelerator, and then it's mounted, um, oh good, so you can see my mouse, and it's mounted right here on a robotic arm like what they use in Detroit to build cars, and so it's computer controlled, and it gives you more degrees of freedom than you can get with a traditional linear accelerator as far as angles of entry into the patient. So it can come around all different angles. And um, uh, the other thing that it does is it can track tumor motion and actually move while it's treating the patient to follow, say, a tumor that's moving while the patient's breathing. Um, that was a really big deal 25 years ago when this was first uh, developed. Um, but um, uh, nowadays, linear accelerators have ways of kind of mimicking that technology. Uh, was there another question or not sure if that was a belated, maybe not. All right. Um, and then this is a tomotherapy unit. So again, it's a linear accelerator right here, which is mounted in a CT gantry unit. So CT scans are nowadays called spiral CTs. They spin around the patient. And as they're spinning around, they're pointing a beam of x-rays, which gets picked up and then converted into an image. In this case, we kind of do the reverse. We use high energy x-rays pointing to the patient to paint the dose into the tumor or into our target area. So the patient lays on the table, they slide through, and then the, uh, the linear accelerator is spinning around the patient and targeting where we want to hit. But these are all linear accelerators. Now, this is not a linear accelerator. This is called a gamma knife. Um, this is going to be a tough question, but do folks think this produces gamma rays or x-rays? Don't overthink this. Gamma rays, very good. So a gamma knife has 192 little cobalt sources in this head, in this uh, kind of helmet here. The patient would lay on the table, they, they get attached to the table, and this is only used for radio surgery. So this is where we use um, high dose, very focused treatments to target areas in the brain. Um, we can do radio surgery also, though, nowadays with cyber knife or linear accelerator based um, uh, um, systems. This is different than traditional radiation. Traditional radiation, let's say for prostate cancer, it's changing, but it, 10 years ago, the traditional prostate cancer treatment would have been about eight weeks, Monday through Friday, of daily radiation. Whereas with radio surgery, it's one treatment to a tumor in the brain. Uh, and you, the goal is to completely obliterate it. And so it's very conformal, meaning we very carefully hit just the tumor itself and maybe a very small rim of normal tissue around it. So in that sense, it's more surgical. Uh, and uh, when we target x-rays at patients, they go in one side. So this is a graph. You can see depth in water on the x-axis and then percent dose on the y-axis. When it enters the body, it's generally its highest energy or dose, and then it tails off as it goes through the body. There is a form of radiation called proton therapy, and that's what this lower graph is showing. Protons have the same effect on cancer cells and on normal tissue or similar effect. Um, but when they go in, depending on the energy we give them, they go to a certain depth and then stop. And so because of that, we can minimize the amount of low-dose radiation that hits normal tissue. And so protons are now being used more around the country, although they're ext quite expensive compared to a linear accelerator. Um, and there's about 20 centers around the country now. Um, I mentioned pediatric patients earlier. So in kids, for example, now we almost always treat them with protons because anything we can do to minimize radiation exposure to normal tissue will potentially reduce risk of long-term toxicity. And I'm gonna kind of not get into it any further. There's uh, another kind of, oh, I see somebody asked, any plans to open a proton center here? So um, there is a proton center in Chicago that's now run by Northwestern. 
Um, you know, our philosophy at the university is protons aren't needed from any of the treatments in which they're used. So we send all of our pediatric patients now, pretty much all of them to the proton center. Uh, and there's rare other circumstances, say retreatment of somebody who's already been treated with radiation or certain types of rare tumors in the base of skull or spine that we'll send to the proton center. But we don't feel that the, you know, we don't really need to keep up with the Jones down the block um, when we can uh, share the, the, you know, the Winnebago that the Jones bought. So somebody else said, my understanding is there's no evidence of a survival benefit from protons in adults. Is there solid data on quality of life from randomized controlled trials? That's a, an excellent question. Um, I don't want to get too sidetracked. Uh, I will, maybe Aviva, if you can send me a reminder, I will send a couple articles out about this. It's in, a whole very interesting health economics question. Uh, in in uh, one minute or less, what I will say is there are not, the goal of protons is not to improve survival. The goal of protons I should say the, the role of protons would be to reduce toxicity in most cases. So you still have to hit the tumor with the same amount of radiation and you're still giving higher dose to normal tissue right around the tumor. Um, there was a trial recently done in glioblastoma, a tumor of the brain, looking at trying to increase the dose with either intensity modulated radiation or protons and see if that improves outcomes in survival. The data on that though, I haven't seen any preliminary data. Um, really what it is more is it's, you know, one of my mentors used to say, you don't need a, a randomized study to know that a steak knife is sharper than a butter knife. And so in certain situations, if I know I can minimize the radiation to normal tissue, I can, you know, just infer that there's going to be lower toxicity. And there are studies coming out in uh, head and neck cancer, esophageal cancer, showing potentially reduced toxicity with protons. One of the most common malignancies treated with protons is uh, prostate cancer, and um, that has never been shown in randomized trials to this date to have re reduced toxicity with protons, but it's used extensively. Um, I'll kind of leave it there. It's an ongoing debate in our field. Uh, another type of radiation is brachytherapy. This is where we insert radiation into the body. This example here is prostate cancer, where we put radioactive iodine seeds in the prostate, but we also use it as part of the standard of care for curative treatment for gynecologic malignancies in particular cervical cancer. Once we decide if we're gonna treat the patient, they undergo a CT scan for a simulation. Um, we immobilize them in the treatment position, and then um, it's a specialized CT scan. We can give contrast dye, we can track their breathing motion. Um, all types of radiation have simulation scans to ensure that we uh, can accurately map out where we're going to target. Then goes to treatment planning. Um, we can fuse in diagnostic imaging that was taken CTs, MRIs, PET scans to, to guide where we contour, where we map out what we wanna treat. Um, when we're mapping out the tumor, we map out something called the gross tumor volume. We can then expand in our computer system based on pathologic data for a clinical target volume, which accounts for microscopic disease or spread. And then off of that, we can do another expansion called a planning target volume, which accounts for day-to-day -day movement of the patient on the treatment table. So the better I can immobilize the patient, the smaller my planning target volume can be. Uh, when we do radio surgery, we actually attach a frame to their head and they're attached to the table. And in those cases, I use no planning target volume because I'm essentially guaranteed they won't move. One of the advantages I mentioned earlier that we now do diagnostic imaging on the treatment table is that allows me uh, to more confidently know I'm hitting the right spot, which allows me to then have a reduced target margin. Uh, so here's an example in a brain tumor. You can see the primary tumor was mapped out in blue. They then did a two centimeter expansion to the green. Because we know that brain tumors don't grow through bone and skin, we don't go out there. So we shave that out of our margin. And then we did another half centimeter expansion for day-to-day -day setup motion or variability. And this, is, this blue to green expansion is based on pathologic data. We know that these types of brain tumors can have microscopic disease within two centimeters of the tumor we see on imaging. We then write a prescription. This is very similar to writing a drug prescription. So it's the amount we're gonna give, how many treatments over how many days. And we work with a dosimetrist or physicist. Uh, their job is to come up with custom radiation plans. 
And there we evaluate the plan that they come up with. We look at coverage of the target. We also look at doses to normal structures. So here's an example of a prostate cancer treatment. You can see the prostate's mapped out in red, the rectum's behind it, the bladder's in front of it, the femoral heads are lateral to it. And so those are all normal structures we're trying to miss. And these lines you see are called isodose lines. So this is like a topographic map. Topographic maps tell us the elevation. This is Mount St. Helens. It was a volcano that erupted in 1980 in Washington State. Um, and so this topographic map, each line tells you the elevation on the volcano. And when we look at these plans, each line tells me the radiation dose. And if I go inside the line, it's a higher radiation dose. If I go outside the line, it's a lower radiation dose. This is a breast cancer treatment. You can see the heart, the breast, and the rib cage. And we look at something called the dose volume histogram. So it's the dose on the x-axis and the volume being treated on the y-axis. So what my dosimetrist always says is you want everything in the lower left except your target. So the target's the breast. You can see almost 100% of the volume, getting almost 100% of my prescription dose of 50 gray. But some of the heart's getting hit. Here's the heart, this blue. And there's even a little bit of the heart getting up to 30 or 40 gray. And if you think about your anatomy, what important blood vessel runs right here? It's the left anterior descending. And if that gets a high dose of radiation, we actually know from population studies of women treated for left-sided breast cancer, they're at an increased risk 20 years later 5, 10, 15, the risk goes up of heart issues. And that's because the heart used to be in the field. So now we do other things to get the heart out of the field. We can treat them laying on their belly. This is called prone. Now you can see their, um, the radiation is completely missing the heart. So when we look at our dose volume histogram, the heart's getting almost no radiation. It gets a lot more complicated. This is a prostate cancer treatment. You're talking to me. <laughs> yeah. I apologize. I have a, a goofball in the room. Um, so today? Maybe if you leave the room right now. I apologize, everybody. Yeah, that was Jacob. Take a bow, Jacob. Oh, okay. I'll take a bow before I'm coming. No. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. So this is, a, <laughs> this is a. This is a dose volume histogram of prostate cancer. So for example, I want my volume of rectum getting 70 gray less than 20%. This is about 12%. Um, I'm gonna move on from here, but just to point out that we very carefully analyze not just the amount of radiation going to our target, but also have very strict constraints. This is an example for prostate cancer of, um, of uh, the dose that we want to minimize, you know, the dose that we, the minimum, the maximum dose we want going to things like the rectum, the bladder, the femoral heads, penile bulb. So that's a lot of what goes on in my clinic on a daily basis. Uh, once they get come in for treatment, they come in daily. They're treated by a radiation therapist. We get films at least once a week. If nowadays, almost a lot of patients, almost all of them are getting daily rate um, X-rays to make sure in the right position. We see the patients once a week to see how they're doing, look for side effects. Uh, and then in follow-up, they usually come back about a month later, and then every three to six months after that. And I have patients I see, I've been practicing seven years now at our Network Cancer Center, and I have patients I treated a month or two after I started it, still come back for annual checkups. Um, I think for the sake of time, I am going to kind of skip over this. Um, I can send out, if folks are interested, I will send out links to a couple of recorded seminars I gave I give for a fourth year medical student, for the fourth year medical student clerkship, uh, there's an hour long seminar about radiation biology and physics. So if this interests you, um, I would encourage you to watch that, uh, but I'm gonna skip over this. Um, I do have one, here, let me just take one second because this is a good way to kind of start to segue into Dr. Wexelbaum's talk, but um, Radiation, the fundamental way radiation kills cancer cells, at least at lower and lower doses, is through DNA damage. Um, one gray of radiation, and so when I treat patients, the kind of conventional fractionation, meaning the amount I give per day is about two gray to a volume. One gray of radiation to a cell is thought to cause about a thousand single strand breaks. And that's not very um, toxic to the cell because cells have really robust mechanisms to repair single strand breaks, basic scission repair, nucleotide excision repair and mismatch repair. 
double strand breaks are what are thought really thought to be the lethal damage to cells. And one gray of radiation causes about 40 double strand breaks. Um, you know, obviously this is a very rough estimate from lab data. Uh, and there's two mechanism cells use to repair double strand breaks, non-homologous end joining and homologous combination. So I had one other question, and this is a free response. You can type it in. Uh, can anybody think of normal cellular processes that use homologous combination and or non-homologous end joining? Very good, meiosis. So meiosis is for, I see somebody typing DNA replication. So meiosis is for homologous combination. The harder one, this is where people usually get stumped, is what normal cellular process in a particular class of cells uses non-homologous end joining. See, somebody wrote receptor. Can they, ah, VDJ, someone got it, very good. So VDJ recombination. So T cells and B cells need to create a variable region of their T cell receptor or B cell receptor antibodies, right? And um, the uh, you have your V, your D, and your J segments in the genes. Those get chopped out. You create a VDJ segment, and that's intentionally a very messy process, right? You know, the goal is to create a whole slew of different kinds of antibody receptors or, or B and T cell receptors. Um, and so one thing to point out is in, um, in cells that are in early, uh, sorry, in um, late S or G2, they have sister chromatids, they can undergo homologous, homologous combination. That's a very high um, fidelity repair mechanism. And by doing this, uh, they, the damage caused by radiation is less likely to be cytotoxic, where cells in G1 and early S are more likely to undergo non-homologous end joining, which is a very messy process, and more likely to have a, a kind of fundamentally cytotoxic attempt at repair, and, they, and they're more likely to die. So cells are differentially sensitive depending on where they are in the cell cycle, the radiation effects. Um, I'm gonna skip through this. Uh, just a couple of cases, and I see Dr. Wexelbaum's on, so I will um, finish up here and turn it over to him. But this is a kind of, all of this comes together. This is a, an example of a modern radiation treatment for a brain tumor. You can see there's beams of radiation coming in from all angles around the head, and it creates this very conformal shape around the tumor that misses, that avoids things like the brain stem, the optic nerves, uh, other critical structures like that. I wanted to show one case example, which actually will be a good, good segue into Dr. Wexelbaum's talk. So. This is a patient that is starting treatment in my clinic oh, next, oh, next week. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, so this lady, I, this lady I treated two years ago for rectal cancer. She got chemotherapy and radiation for five and a half weeks and then had a surgical resection. She has a permanent ostomy and she is doing well, was doing well. And then about a year ago was found to have a recurrent tumor in her right lower lobe. It was the only site of disease in her body. It was biopsied and shown to be re metastatic rectal cancer. So she actually underwent surgical resection. She had a right lower lobectomy um, and was again uh, had no evidence of disease, and then about three months ago had a surveillance PET scan and was found to have a recurrent tumor in her right hilum, so right under the right main stem bronchus. I treated that with 10 fractions of radiation. That's now disappeared or gone, but she developed a single small tumor. Gone. That's the commentary from the peanut gallery. Single small oh, peanut, tumor oh, in, the, in the left lower lobe. All right, it's, it was, um, it's right here. It's behind this little green. You can see it on the CT scan. So what I did was I contoured it. This is the GTV in kind of three-dimensional space. We then expanded it. This is now the PTV Isn't here. Amazing, whoever you're talking to more. Um, so this is a safety margin of five millimeters around the tumor. And then we planted out using eight beams from all around her body. Now her prior radiation treatment was over here on the right. 
So we had to use beams that aren't going through or retreated previously. And that develops a radiation plan with a very conformal dose right around this. So this is going to be treated with stereotactic body radiation, five treatments of 10 gray each day. And that is enough that it should obliterate the tumor and get rid of it. Um, this shows you the low dose right around it. So this is 50% dose. So you can see even that's very minimal dose around hitting normal tissue. So she'll have essentially, knock on wood, she should have... She should have no significant side effects from this kind of treatment. Hello. I apologize. I had to oh. threaten no tickle wrestling if you didn't leave. So, um, so she will be treated next week. Now we have one problem, and then I'm gonna. Finish up, turn it over to Dr. Wexelbaum. So take your time, Dad. Take your time. So if she when she exhales, here's the tumor. Now, this is actually a different patient I treated seven years ago, but very similar location. Uh, you can see this white mark, and it is actually a seed that we put in to track the tumor. And when this patient inhales, it moves out of my target volume. So that's a problem, right? If I don't hit the tumor, I'm not gonna kill the cancer. So what can I do about that? Well, one option would be to expand my target volume to have a bigger safety margin. So no matter where it moves and the patient's breathing, I can hit it. Um, but that means treating more normal tissue, which would increase risk of side effects. So we do something else. We can do something called respiratory gating, where we get a four-dimensional four CT scan. So it's a special CT where we can see their breathing motion. And then we can track their breathing on the treatment table. And when the patient exhales, the machine turns on. When it senses that they're inhaling, it turns off. And so we only have to treat the area of tumor, or the area in the body where the tumor is when they exhale. So this is a, allows smaller target margins. And so this is that patient. I just kind of switched patients on you that I treated several years ago. You can see before treatment, and then in May of 2014, it's essentially completely gone. And this is actually one of the patients I still see in follow up. Uh, the tumor is gone, and he's. Uh, seven years out now doing great. So um, I'll finish there. Uh, if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to I see. Okay, sorry. Um, for the case of the first patient with metastatic cancer, is the goal therapeutic or curative? Well, <laughs> that is an excellent question. So uh, there are case series, and Dr. Wexelbaum, who's going to speak next about oligometastases, will probably will talk about this, I think. But there our case series going back decades of patients with one, two, maybe three metastases from colon cancer or sarcoma or other malignancies that would have surgical resection because we didn't have this kind of radiation technology 50 years ago or 30 years ago. And a percent of them, probably around 20 to 30% could actually be cured. Maybe that's slightly optimistic, but there were a, a, a fraction of those patients cured. So yes, the goal is cure because we treat other diseases like pancreatic cancer or certain brain tumors with curative intent that have lower cure rates than that. Um, well, actually, in the question that you asked, just now that I'm reading it again, is, is the goal therapeutic or curative? Well, I would think of it more, is it curative, is it ablative, or is it palliative? So we do a lot of palliative radiation for symptoms from cancer. So patients will often have pain in, from bone metastases or bleeding from tumors involving the, the bronchi and the lungs or uh, bulky gynecologic malignancies, GI malignancies that are bleeding. And we'll give a low dose of radiation that's enough to control the symptoms, the pain, the bleeding, but not enough to cause normal tissue damage and it's not going to cure or ablate the tumor. Whereas in this patient's treatment, it's ablative, meaning we will completely get rid of that cancer and because it's her only site of disease, yes, it is curative, although her chance of being cured now that this is her second site of metastatic disease is on the very low side, I would say. But there's even studies showing that it delays the time until they need systemic therapy. So even if you can prolong their survival or reduce their length in the time they don't need chemotherapy, that can improve their quality of life. 